Welcome to Cincinnati, the Queen City, a place filled with curiosities and captivating stories. Take, for example, the wild popularity of a comic strip called The Gumps back in 1923. Created by Sidney Smith, this comic strip followed the lives of the Gump family and was so influential it earned Smith a fortune through various adaptations and merchandise. The Gumps became a part of Cincinnati, with the locals treating them as their own neighbors. But that's not all. The Queen City also has a rich past, with mysterious poisoning cases, barber surgeons, unique Halloween traditions, and a campaign against cheap pistol sales that shook the city. Cincinnati's history also recalls the existence of tramps, hobos, and even baseball players with intriguing side hustles during the off-season. But the one tale that will leave you on the edge of your seat is, well, let's save that for later, shall we? What's up, my amazing and curious folks, ready to unravel some mysteries together? I'm Caesar, and here with me, as always, is the fabulous Sonia. Say hello, Sonia. Hi there, everyone. Remember, we're here to feed your curiosity every day. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit that bell icon so you don't miss a single episode of the Curiosity Wonderland. Stay curious, my friends. So back in 1923, Cincinnati fell head over heels for a comic strip called The Gumps. Created by Sidney Smith, the comic was a huge hit and the Gumps became almost like a part of the family to the residents of Cincinnati. Their storylines were so engaging that readers couldn't help but be drawn into their world. When the Gumps found themselves facing a bleak Christmas after a disastrous business venture, the people of Cincinnati were deeply affected. Oh, that reminds me of something from my own childhood. I remember growing up, we had this local comic strip that was all the rage. It wasn't anything as grand as the Gumps, but it was endearing in its own way. The story centered around a family of quirky and lovable characters, each with their own unique quirks and charms and their day-to-day -day life in our little town. I remember how everyone in school would be talking about the latest strip and the shenanigans that the characters had gotten up to. On some level, we all felt connected to them, almost as if they were our own neighbors. It's funny how stories, whether in the form of comics or otherwise, can bring people together and create a shared sense of community. Continuing with the story of Andy Gump and his family, things took a dramatic turn when their business partner, J. Ambrose Hepwing, swindled them and ran away. Andy was left bankrupt and offering a reward of $1,000 for information leading to Hepwing's arrest. A fascinating part about this is how the community of Cincinnati rallied behind this fictional family. The Times Star newspaper even reported on the various tips they received about the whereabouts of the swindler, Hepwing. But what's even more surprising is that John L. Ritchie, manager of the Adjustment Bureau of the Cincinnati Association of Credit Men, decided to use Andy's fictional predicament as a case study to demonstrate how his organization could assist companies faced with bankruptcy. The entire city was so engrossed in the comic that it spilled over into real life. This event is a great example of how stories, even fictional ones, can influence and shape the real world. It truly shows the power of storytelling and the world of comics. What might seem like just an idle pastime can actually be a mirror reflecting our society and even influencing it in profound ways. As we delve deeper into the story of the Gumps, we find out that all their financial troubles were merely a test by Uncle Bim, or should I say Uncle Bimbo, to evaluate Andy's financial acumen. It's amazing how the series kept readers on their toes, navigating through one plot twist after another. The story of the Gumps doesn't end there. The strip continued till 1959, even after the untimely death of its original creator, Sidney Smith, in 1935. In fact, did you know that one of the assistants to Gus Edison, who took over the comic after Smith, was none other than the actor Martin Landau? This comic strip had such a far-reaching influence that it even had a radio version from 1931 to 1937, with Agnes Moorhead, who later starred in the TV series Bewitched as part of the cast. The legacy of the Gumps really is something. But what really stands out to me is how the comic strip's story intertwined with real-life events in Cincinnati and how it stirred the emotions and actions of its readers. 
It gives us a glimpse into the power of storytelling. What about you, our amazing listeners? Isn't it fascinating how a comic strip from a century ago can still have us hooked on its narrative? It makes me marvel at the timelessness of a good story. Are you just as intrigued by the tale of the Gumps as I am? Are you finding these tidbits of history as fascinating as I am? Let us know in the comments. And if you're enjoying our deep dive into Cincinnati's curiosities, remember to hit that like button. Let's continue this journey of discovery together. Moving on from the Gumps for a bit, let's delve into another intriguing episode from the annals of Cincinnati's history. This one involves the peculiar crimes committed in a two-story house on Dayton Street. The house was owned by a renowned and aged Methodist minister, the Reverend Dr. Mordecai J.W. Ambrose. One morning, the family members, except for one, started experiencing stomach pains after having breakfast. The new servant girl, Violet Foster, was suspected as she was found faking her symptoms. The doctor diagnosed it as arsenic poisoning. However, nobody died thanks to his timely intervention. Wait a minute, how was the arsenic poisoning detected so quickly? Great question. Arsenic poisoning is usually detected through symptoms such as stomach pain, vomiting, and diarrhea. In more severe cases, it can lead to numbness in hands and feet, muscle cramping, and even death. In this case, the doctor was able to diagnose based on these symptoms. And how was Violet Foster found faking her symptoms? Well, it's often quite difficult to fake physical symptoms convincingly. In Violet's case, when the police detective ordered her to come downstairs, she immediately got up showing no signs of distress, which was a clear indication that she was not really sick. But the plot thickens. Upon investigation, the police discovered that Violet, who had also used the alias of Lena High, had bought arsenic the previous night from the Overbeck drugstore. However, it wasn't as straightforward a case as it seemed. The story takes an unexpected turn when Violet Foster, or rather, Faltha Gilliam, which was her real name, confessed that Charles Winold, Susie Winold's ex-husband, was behind the arsenic poisoning. Really? But wasn't he far away at the time of the poisoning? Yes, you're right. In fact, Winold had alibis for all the times Gilliam claimed he was at the Ambrose house. On the day of the poisoning, he was in a hotel in Toledo. So, how did the police proceed after that? Well, the police found that Gilliam's real identity was Faltha Gilliam, and her story started to crumble. She had lied about her past, and her parents, who she'd claimed were dead, were found living in poverty in Lower Price Hill. That's quite a twist. What happened to Gilliam, then? Faltha Gilliam was tried and sentenced to four years in the Ohio Penitentiary. At her sentencing, Newspapers reported that she had been flirting so much with the male prisoners at the county jail that two young men were ready to fight a duel over her. And what about Charles Winold? Well, due to Gilliam's discredited testimony, Winold, despite his confessed kidnapping of his children, managed to escape any blame in the case. Very few newspapers questioned the version of the story presented in court. The Commercial Tribune reported that Gilliam, who had once worked as a traveling salesperson herself, had met Winold on a train in Indiana and reunited with him in Cincinnati. According to the report, Winold had encouraged her to take the servant position at his ex-wife's house. This puts an interesting spin on the story, suggesting Winold may have intentionally set Gilliam up to take the blame while he established his alibis. However, it was never clarified why Gilliam served the deadly oatmeal to Winold's children after his ex-wife had refused it. So what happened to Gilliam, Winold, and the rest of the family afterwards? Faltha Gilliam was released from the penitentiary a year early due to good behavior and then seems to have vanished from the historical record. Charles Winold moved back to his hometown, Massillon, remarried in the year 1905, and passed away from prostate cancer in 1914. As for the Winold family, Susie Winold dedicated her life to the Methodist Church and lived until the age of 80 in New Jersey. Harold and Francis, the children, recovered fully from their deadly breakfast. Harold served in the Navy through World War I, got married, and had a daughter, while Francis married a man in Michigan in the year 1915. And what about the nurse, Ellen Galvin? Interestingly, Ellen M. Galvin sued Dr. Ambrose in the pharmacy for their roles in the poisoning 
asking for $2,400 from each. However, both cases were dismissed. Despite her claim that the poisoning left her unable to work, she continued to be listed as a nurse in the Cincinnati City Directory for several more years. Shifting gears a bit, the article takes us back to the time when barbers did much more than just shaves and haircuts. For instance, a barber named Peter Mushler used up to 6,000 leeches in a year. 6,000 leeches? What was he doing with all those leeches? Leeches were applied to black eyes and other bruises to drain the accumulated blood and reduce swelling. They were in high demand all over the city, as those were rather tumultuous times with regular street fights and brawls. So barbers were also sort of doctors then? Yes, they performed minor surgical tasks that provided a solid income. They practiced cupping, which was a popular cure for fevers and general aches and pains. They also pulled teeth, and the revenue derived from these procedures was quite substantial. And how did the people feel about their barbers practicing these medical procedures on them? Well, in those times, there wasn't a clear separation between the roles of a barber and a surgeon. In fact, in the year 1540, Henry VIII of England affirmed the right of barbers to perform bloodletting and tooth extraction while prohibiting surgeons from cutting hair or trimming beards. That's fascinating. But I can imagine it must have been quite a task managing rowdy patients fresh from baroom brawls. Indeed, it was a different world back then. Barbers had to deal with a host of challenges that we wouldn't associate with their profession today. Continuing our journey through the past, we come across a story of a Cincinnati barber named Christopher Eberl. One night, two men walked into his shop looking quite beaten up. They asked for leeches, but when Eberl asked for payment, they assaulted him and caused quite a scene. That sounds like quite a night for the poor barber. Indeed. Eberl had to call in the police, who had a hard time getting the men to the lockup. The charges against them were disorderly conduct, personal violence, and assault and battery. Sounds like a tough job being a barber back then. It was, and the connection between barbering and blood is represented in the traditional barber pole with its red, white, and blue stripes. Some believe the red symbolizes arteries, the blue veins, and the white skin. That's a vivid representation. It is. However, over time, barbers moved away from the medical side of their profession. An interesting event in 1927 saw Boy Scouts in Cincinnati searching all over the city for leeches to save the life of a sleeping sickness victim. That's a heartwarming story. Did they find any leeches? They did, in a small downtown barber shop. These leeches were sent to the patient and his condition improved remarkably. Incredible. Yes, and while barbers stepped away from more surgical tasks, they continued to provide additional services. Some barbershops even offered baths for just 25 cents. Digging deeper into the history, we learn that Cincinnati was home to a large number of barbers. In the year of 1882, Cincinnati had a thousand barbers, and a vast majority were of German extraction. That's a large number of barbers for a city with a population of just over 225,000. It certainly is. Also, the diversity among barbers was quite remarkable. 91 were African-American, 50 were Irish, 46 were Americans by blood and birth, and the remaining were from various backgrounds, including English, Jewish, Italian, Scottish, and French. So it wasn't just a profession, it was a melting pot of cultures. And there were some really unique barbers among them. There was a highly skilled barber who was totally blind, and another who had only one arm, but had a sterling reputation. That's inspiring. It goes to show that overcoming adversities can lead to greatness. Absolutely. Now let's shift from the barbers to the nights before Halloween. Halloween used to be more about tricks than treats, being restricted to two or three nights. In St. Mary's, Ohio, the schedule was quite interesting. It included a cabbage night, a corn night, and then Halloween. Cabbage night and corn night, what were those about? Well, corn night was the last night before Halloween, when kids threw shelled corn against windows, rang doorbells, and soaped a few windows. As for Cabbage Night, the article doesn't provide details, but it's clear these traditions added to the mischief of the season. To add to our Halloween excursion, 
The week leading up to Halloween was full of mischief and pranks, starting with Tic Tac Night and ending with Halloween. Tic Tac Night? What's that about? It involved a device built around an old sewing spool attached to a long stick. When the string wrapped around the spool was pulled, it sounded like someone was rapping on the window. It was a little bit like corn night, just louder. And what about gate night? That involved moving the gates from their usual locations. For example, you might wake up to find your gate hanging from the belfry of the town hall. That certainly would be a surprise. What about goosey night? Goosey night was dedicated to scaring pedestrians with noisemakers and eerie lanterns. Mischief night and trick night were pretty much what they sound like. Nights filled with pranks and mischief. Sounds like Halloween was quite the event. But what about this cabbage night? Ah, the cabbage. Cabbages found their way into the Halloween festivities because they were used by young ladies to predict their future husbands. And cabbage night was all about swiping leftover cabbages from gardens and tossing them onto front porches. That's some unexpected use for cabbages, I must say. Halloween really had a different flavor back then. You might be wondering how these cabbages ended up being tossed onto porches. Well, we have a charming explanation from a Cincinnati Times correspondent back in 1875. After young ladies used cabbages to predict their future husbands, they would toss the clairvoyant cabbages onto the nearest porch, or maybe even the porch of their prospective father-in-law. A kind of symbolic gesture, then? Exactly. Also, there was another divination technique involving three bowls. One filled with clear water, another with mud or ashes, and the third left empty. The person seeking revelations would be blindfolded, the bowls shuffled around, and then the blindfolded person would stick their fingers in one of the bowls. What did each bowl signify? If they touched clear water, they would marry a virgin. If they touched the mud or ashes, they would marry a widow or widower. And if they found the empty bowl, they'd remain single for life. It seems Halloween was a serious time for romance and divination back then. But why did these traditions fade away? There are many reasons. One is that Halloween has expanded to become a broader celebration. It was for a long time considered a holiday for children. The idea of adults participating or dressing up for Halloween is relatively modern, but another reason is due to active police suppression. During the 1930s, some pranks and mischief got completely out of hand. How out of hand are we talking about? Imagine flaming barricades blocking streets, tool sheds set ablaze, gangs firing rifles at windows in occupied houses, all the windows of a school being broken, piles of garbage filling alleys, and dozens of fist fights. The police had to intervene due to the escalating chaos and destruction. The mischief of Halloween seemed to escalate in the 1960s as it transformed from mischief night into damage night. The pranks and tricks of the night became more destructive and dangerous. How destructive are we talking about? We're talking about serious incidents like grass fires and foot-deep craters in entrances to highways. In 1986, 59 cars had their tires punctured by vandals in Brentwood. That sounds like something that would cause more harm than fun. Absolutely. It's quite a leap from the innocent pranks of stealing gates and tossing cabbages. This escalation in dangerous activities likely contributed to the police suppression we talked about earlier. It seems the shift from innocent pranks to more harmful activities was a significant turning point for Halloween traditions. Yes, it was a pivotal moment that shifted the perception of Halloween from a night of harmless fun to one associated with potentially dangerous mischief. It definitely changed the dynamic of this festive holiday. This tale takes a sharp turn here. It seems that during this time, there was a certain journalist who attempted to use satire to campaign against the sale of pistols. The United States in the 1920s was a violent place with firearms often being the weapon of choice. The journalist wasn't on board with this. No, he wasn't. He saw the city's casual attitude towards pistol sales as a problem, especially considering the number of harmful incidents stemming from these sales. So what did this journalist do? In an attempt at satire, he published a letter in his column purportedly written by a Chicago burglar who had relocated to Cincinnati and easily procured a pistol. 
However, he found it harder to get his hands on other tools of his trade, such as crowbars and noiseless hammers. And how did the public react to this? Well, the journalist faced criticism, with readers accusing him and his newspaper of promoting crime and lawlessness. Yet, he stood his ground arguing that it was unfair to sell pistols to burglars, but deny them the right to buy other, less deadly tools. That's quite a stand to take. What led him to this? His campaign was particularly fueled by two murders committed with cheap, locally purchased pistols. One of the victims was a Cincinnati policeman killed while breaking up a crowd. The other was a 14-year-old girl named Minnie McFerrin from Covington. The tragedy of Minnie McFerrin's death is one for the books. Amidst a troubled family life, 14-year-old Minnie and her 12-year-old sister found solace in the home of a kind neighbor, Sally Padlin. Unfortunately, jealousy and resentment drove their father to purchase a pistol and confront Mrs. Padlon. That sounds horrific. How did that end? It was a tragedy indeed. In a drunken rage, their father shot at Mrs. Padlin, but the bullet missed and fatally struck Minnie instead. The public was outraged and the incident was used to question the city's reluctance to regulate pistol sales. I can imagine the anger and frustration that must have caused. Did this lead to any changes? Surprisingly, the answer is no. Despite the journalists' efforts and the public's outrage, the city did nothing to regulate the sale of pistols. The political climate of Cincinnati in the early 1920s was firmly under the control of a political machine, and even when a draft ordinance to regulate pistol sales was presented, it was met with indifference. That's frustrating. It seems like a clear issue that needed addressing. Indeed. However, within two weeks of this frustration being voiced, a new city council was elected that was mostly free of the influence of the previous political machine. As we move on, our story takes us to the late 1920s, where another social trend was causing a stir. It was a time when the idea of trial marriages was causing quite a controversy. Trial marriages? Yes, trial marriages. This was a concept that was increasingly common among Ohio teenagers in the late 20s. They would elope to northern Kentucky, where the marriage laws were much looser, and then when things didn't work out, they'd return to Ohio, asking the courts to annul their union. That, that sounds quite radical for that era. What was the public reaction to this? The concept was highly controversial. Judge Stanley Struble was particularly vocal about his concerns, criticizing the casual attitude of clerks issuing marriage licenses and those performing the ceremonies. He felt that these people were more interested in collecting fees than considering the long-term consequences of these hasty unions. I can imagine that wasn't well received by everyone. Indeed, it wasn't. The concept of trial marriages, giving couples a no-fault option to leave the marriage after a brief trial period, was an idea that had been stirring debate since the early 1900s. It was a suggestion presented by anthropologist Elsie Clues Parsons in her book The Family. It was widely read but also widely condemned. The Cincinnati Post even claimed that it was already too easy to end a marriage, and what was needed was a reform discouraging the view of marriage as a mere experiment. This concept of trial marriages is quite intriguing. It reminds me of a story from my own teenage years. Oh, do tell. We're all ears. Well, when I was about 16, I remember there was this popular local band that everyone was crazy about. They had the greatest hit song that summer. But the interesting part of their story was that two of the band members, the lead guitarist and the drummer, were a young couple. They had grown up together, started dating in high school, and then formed this band. Sounds like a romantic story. Yes, it had all the makings of a fairy tale. But here's where it gets relevant to our topic. Being young and deeply in love, they decided they wanted to get married. However, their families were understandably concerned about their young age. They suggested something that looking back was a lot like a trial marriage. Really, what did they propose? The families suggested the young couple move in together, continue with their band, and see how they manage their relationship, living together, and their shared responsibilities. They wanted them to experience the realities before making any lifelong commitments. And how did that work out for them? It was quite an interesting journey for them. 
The couple had their share of ups and downs, but they grew together as a team. They learned a lot about each other and about managing their own lives, which in turn influenced their music. Eventually, they did get married, but that initial period of living together was a valuable experience for them. That's a fascinating story, a real life trial marriage. Thanks for sharing that. It's an interesting perspective on how different forms of commitments can give people the space to understand each other better before making lifelong decisions. The concept of trial marriages sparked a lot of debate. Interestingly, a judge once suggested that a typical marriage already had a built-in trial period of 10 years. 10 years? That's quite a long trial period. Yes, but the judge noted that couples who managed to stay together for 10 years would most likely stay married for the rest of their lives. So the judge was saying the first 10 years are the most critical? Exactly. In fact, the judge's data showed that more than half of the divorce suits he dealt with were from couples who hadn't even reached their five-year anniversary. So in essence, the first five to 10 years are a natural trial period, according to this judge? That's right. But this didn't stop the entertainment industry from featuring the trial marriage concept in plays and films. And I suppose these shows only added fuel to the fire of controversy. Absolutely. Even into the rock and roll era, advice columns were still warning young women to avoid oversexed men who proposed this immoral arrangement of trial marriage, stating that it usually led to sacrifices and potential harm for the women involved. Moving on, let's dive into a bit of theater history. We have here Frank Frayn, a popular sharpshooter in his time. He brought a unique blend of entertainment and sensation to the stage. Sharpshooter, you say? How does that tie into theater? Well, Frayn incorporated his sharpshooting skills into his stage acts. He played the roles of heroic characters who had to shoot their way out of dangerous situations. So it's like action-packed theater then? Exactly. And he didn't stop there. Frayn also included animals in his productions, like a dog named Jack, a lion, hyenas, and even wrestling bears. That sounds like quite the spectacle. It definitely was. His show Mardo was said to be full of desperate actions, threats, fire scenes, and murders, and the audience loved it. And despite all the drama, was there an underlying message in his shows? The underlying message could be related more to the character Frayn portrayed, a man of action, a heroic figure. But remember, this was a time when such sensationalism was loved by audiences. It was more about the thrill and excitement than any profound message. Fascinating. It's interesting to see how different times and cultures perceive entertainment. Absolutely. The tastes and preferences of audiences evolve with society, and what was popular then might not necessarily hold the same appeal today. Now, let's talk about a tragic event that marked Frayn's career during one of the performances of C. Slocum. Oh, this sounds intense. What happened? During a critical scene, Slocum, played by Frayn, was supposed to shoot an apple off his wife's head using a mirror to aim while facing backward. The wife's role was played by Frayn's real-life fiance, Annie Von Baron. That sounds incredibly dangerous. Did something go wrong? Unfortunately, yes. For reasons still not fully understood, the trick shot failed and Frayn accidentally shot Annie, causing her death. That's terrible. What was the reaction? The audience was petrified. The curtain dropped immediately and the theater manager had to come out and ask everyone to collect their refunds as they left. I can't imagine the shock and horror. What happened to Frayn after this incident? The following day, an inquest was conducted. Some suggested that Frayn's rifle malfunctioned. Others pointed to a defective cartridge. There were also questions about why Annie wasn't wearing her usual metal cap under her wig. So it was a combination of unfortunate events and oversights. Yes, it was a tragic accident that underscores the risks of such dangerous stunts. Despite the tragedy, Frayn returned to the stage within a year, reviving his role of Cy Slocum. I can't help but wonder how he managed to continue after such a devastating incident. It must have been incredibly difficult, but Frayn did make a significant change. His new wife, Margaret Thompson, refused to join him on stage perhaps out of safety concerns. Sounds like a wise decision. Did the incident have any lasting impacts? Indeed it did. 
The Coliseum Theater, where the incident occurred, was renamed due to public opinion. The owner's son, Robert Huyck, mentioned that the court decision declaring Frayn's innocence wasn't well received by many people. The theater had to change its name? That's indicative of how deeply the incident affected the community. Right, the theater was initially renamed as the New Theater and later became Hike's Opera House. The original Hike's Opera House was renamed as The People's. And is the theater still around? Unfortunately, the building was demolished. Today, all that remains of the once vibrant theater is a parking lot. Moving on to a different part of Cincinnati's history, in late 19th century, the city seemed to be under siege by what was referred to then as tramps. Tramps, as in homeless people or wanderers? Exactly. These tramps were often unhoused and unemployed men who were scapegoats for anything the city complained about. And where were they coming from? Many of them were picked up near the Big Four railroad tracks as they arrived in town. But it wasn't just adults. Teenage boys from different cities also found themselves among these tramps. Wait, teenage boys? How did they end up there? It was common for groups of tramps to kidnap teenage boys and force them to beg for food. There are stories of boys from St. Louis, Zanesville, and Columbus who were forced into this lifestyle. That's horrifying. Were there any efforts to help these boys or deal with the tramp problem? The police did make arrests and there were plans to break up the camps. But the issue was complex. Some professional thieves used these camps as hideouts, disguising themselves as common tramps. It sounds like a challenging situation, a real societal problem. Indeed. In some localities, residents even resorted to vigilante tactics to chase the tramps out of town. It was a tough time in Cincinnati's history. The tramp problem escalated to the point where they started occupying vacant properties, such as the old Ransom Homestead. They used the place as a base for foraging and cooking. That's really unsettling. Were the local residents and authorities just standing by and watching? It got to the point where residents, particularly women, were afraid to pass the place. They eventually notified the police to get rid of the intruders. Even some brave local boys, armed with slingshots and stones, tried to chase the tramps away from public places like Washington Park. Wow, so this was a community-wide issue, and who were these tramps, really? The 1890s were a time of economic recession, and many tramps were unemployed men who had lost hope of finding work. Some tragic stories emerged, like that of John Winters, who ended up with frostbitten feet that had to be amputated after a failed job search. That's heartbreaking. And I assume there were others like him? Sadly, there were. Some tramps were even deserters from the U.S. Army. For instance, three men named Charles Frank, Harry Cantington, and Ben Canine were swept up in a roundup of tramps at the Baltimore and Ohio rail yards. It seems like a complex situation, a mix of economic downturn, lack of opportunities, and even personal choices. It paints a very grim picture of that period in Cincinnati's history. To give you an even deeper understanding of these tramps, they came from diverse backgrounds and situations. Some were seasonally unemployed, like Circus Frank Doyle, who followed the Robinson Circus around the country doing odd jobs in warm weather and took shelter in the police station during colder months. Did the police just allow them to stay in the station? Yes, they had a room in the basement available where homeless men could sleep on the floor. But it wasn't all grim. Tramps and hobos also became an ongoing source of comedy. They were frequently featured in vaudeville acts and comic strips. That's an unexpected twist. It seems like they were a part of everyday life, whether people liked it or not. Very true, although their life was often hard and even fatal. Some ended up in hospitals due to accidents or trespassing incidents. Others were not so lucky and lost their lives. Now, you mentioned earlier that some of the tramps were deserters from the U.S. Army. Were there other ways they made a living? It varied. Some, like the deserters, found work wherever they could. But don't forget, many of these men were unemployed not by choice, but by circumstance. The economic situation at that time made it very difficult for them to find stable work. Now, let's take a slight detour and revisit the baseball scene in Cincinnati during the early 1900s. Unlike today's players, the pros of that era had off-season jobs, 
usually far removed from their exploits on the baseball diamond. Really? What kind of jobs are we talking about? Well, for instance, Red's second baseman Ed Phelps spent his winters earning a business degree. Bob Ewing, a pitcher for the Reds, used his off-season to manage his champion horse breeding farm. There was Charlie Chech, who pitched for the Reds for a couple of years and worked as a pharmacist in St. Paul during the off-season. That's quite a range. I'm guessing not all of them transitioned into regular jobs after their pro years. Indeed, some continued to thrive in the world of sports. For instance, John Barry, who passed through Cincinnati during his decade in the majors, spent his off-season coaching football at Niagara University. So, it's safe to say that the Reds players of that era were quite a versatile bunch. Indeed they were. In fact, Miller Huggins, a local boy from Walnut Hills, who later managed the St. Louis Cardinals and the New York Yankees, partnered with Cliff Martin to run a tobacconist shop throughout much of his career. It seems like a completely different era. Today's players have contracts that earn them millions, and they can afford off-season vacations and training camps. True. But remember, back then, even though the players earned comparatively good money for their time, they also were mindful of their future once their pro years ended. They took advantage of the off-season to build a career outside baseball, laying the foundation for a secure future. Now let's talk about Fred Odwell, who owned a large quarry in Downsville, New York. He looked after it during the winter, while his brother managed it in the summer. After his baseball career, he became a real estate broker and later landed an appointment as postmaster for Downsville. It seems like a lot of these players had entrepreneurial spirits. They knew how to make good use of their off-season time. Absolutely. Another example is Hans Lobert, an infielder for the Reds. He built houses as a carpenter and contractor in Pittsburgh during the off-season. Then there was Andy Coakley who, after attending dental school, ran a New York insurance agency while coaching baseball at Columbia University. He actually discovered prolific slugger Lou Gehrig while at Columbia. That must have been quite a find. So, besides baseball, these men had successful careers off of the diamond. Yes, they did. And it didn't stop there. The Reds even had an actual doctor on the team, though his specialty might surprise you. Dr. Frank Noodles Hahn was a veterinarian specializing in horses and cattle. While pitching for Cincinnati, Hahn also attended the Cincinnati Veterinary College and later joined their faculty. So he went from throwing fastballs to teaching about animal health. That is quite a switch. Indeed, it is. But for Hahn, it was a passion. He had an impressive rookie year with the Reds, winning 23 games while losing only eight with an earned run average of 2.68. But the Reds were never high ranking in the National League during his time, despite his personal achievements. As for Dr. Noodles Hahn, his baseball career came to an abrupt end when his arm gave out after several seasons of averaging 300 innings. He managed to limp through a half season with the New York Highlanders before realizing that it was time to leave the field for a different line of work. And what a switch it was, right? From a successful baseball career to veterinary medicine. What happened next? You see, Han was a man of many talents. The Washington Post once declared him the best piano player in baseball, and there was even talk of him pursuing music professionally. But it was his passion for large animal veterinary work that ultimately won out. So he found a whole new career path after his baseball days ended? Yes, he did. He even continued to coach and pitch for some semi-pro teams for a while, but he spent the majority of his post-baseball career as a federal meat inspector in Cincinnati. That's remarkable. It's like he had two completely different lives. It really is quite a story. Even in his 70s, Han kept a locker at Crosley Field. He would visit the ballpark on game day, work out with the team, and pitch batting practice. Then he'd change back into his business clothes to watch the game. And you know what's most fascinating? When an ice skating rink opened at the Terrace Plaza, septuagenarian Noodles Han was there, showing off his fancy technique. Wow, a baseball legend turned veterinarian turned ice skater. That's something you don't hear every day. Truly a man of many talents. Noodles Han lived a full and vibrant life, passing away at the age of 80 in a retirement home in North Carolina. 
His story really proves that life is full of unexpected turns. Well, what an incredible journey we've taken through the historical streets of Cincinnati. It's impressive to see how the city's past is filled with fascinating tales, from the adventures of the comic strip family, the Gumps, to the chilling poisoning case on Dayton Street. And who could forget those baseball players with their remarkable side hustles during the off-season? Cincinnati is indeed a treasure trove of curiosities. And what a ride it's been. It's like peeling back the layers of a city to reveal the heart of its people over the years, their joys, their struggles, their resilience. And it shows us too how cities are living, breathing entities, always evolving, always surprising. A big thank you to all our listeners for joining us on this thrilling trip through time. On this note, we must say goodbye. But before we do, don't forget to blast that like button and leave us a comment. We want to hear your thoughts and please do share this episode with your friends. Yes, we'd absolutely love to hear from you. And remember, there's always another mystery waiting to be revealed in our next episode. So until then, take care and goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Stay curious. I found this fascinating tale on the site hando.tumblr.com in an article titled Cincinnati Curiosities, penned by Greg Hand and published on December 24, 2023. If you want to delve deeper into the subject, the full URL is in the video description. Now I'm off.